patient was a 68 year old male, known case of dilated cardiomyopathy, came with a left intertrochanteric fracture, and he was posted for the PFN. History, patient had history of fall three days back. The history of dyspnea on exertion grade three was present and exercise tolerance was poor. Uh, there was no history suggestive of head injury, no other significant surgical or medical history. Patient was alcoholic and patient was on drug tablet Ecosprin AB 7520, tablet Valentas 50 mg and tablet Alloctone 25 mg. In general examination, patient was conscious, pulse was 84 per minute, irregular, 4 to 6 missed beats per minute, Peripheral precession well paid. Blood pressure was 102 by 66 millimeter of mercury. JVP not raised. No edema. SPOT was 97% broom air. And airway was not difficult. In the systemic examination, CVS, S1, S2 normal, systolic murmur was present and other system, RS, CNS per abdomen within normal limit. Investigation. All blood investigations were within normal limit, even the electrolyte. X-ray chest, cardiomegaly was present. ECG, LVPP was present and occasional VPCs. 2D echo, dilated cardiomyopathy, LVAF was 20 to 25%, global left ventricular hypokinesia, moderate MR, mild AR, TR, dilated LA, dilated, grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. Cardiologist fitness was present or taken. First time when patient posted for the surgery, uh, plan of anesthesia was general anesthesia. High risk uh, risk explained to the uh, relatives and patient and consent taken. All routine and emergency drugs kept ready. Defibrillator was ready. IV line was already secured and IV fluid RL was on flow. Patient shifted in the OT, monitor attached, ECG, NIVP, SPO2, ETCO2. We pre-oxygenated patient with the 100% oxygen. Pre-medication given injection midazolam 0.5 mg, injection fentanyl 50 microgram. After giving the sedation, patient had hemodynamic instability. There is a fall on blood pressure up to 60 millimeter of mercury and the multiple arrhythmias. So we started the noradrenaline drip and as the blood pressure started improving, cardiac and bolus started. And all this hemodynamic instability and arrhythmia occurred before induction of anesthesia. So decided to postpone the case. So shifted patient to the ICU for the cardiac optimization, which is done by the cardiologist. So the dilated cardiomyopathy, that is the most common cardiomyopathy, third most common cause of congestive heart failure and most common indication for the heart transplantation. That reduces the global myocardial contractility, leading to the left ventricle or biventricular dysfunction. DCM presents with the decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction, congestive heart failure and the ventricular arrhythmia. Initially, the ventricle dilates to increase the force of contraction and stroke volume. However, this compensatory mechanism gradually fails. Progressive ventricular failure ensues and the cardiac output decreases. So, the goal of anesthesia management in DCM is to minimize negative endotrophic effect of anesthetic drug, maintain the preload, prevent increase in afterload, and control arrhythmias, hypotension, tachycardia. So, after cardiac optimization, when second time patient posted for the anesthesia, Pramod and I did this case. So, we decided to give the segmental epidural to this patient. Again, all the emergency drugs and equipments were ready, monitor attached. This time, we secured the CBP line for assessment of the fluid and giving the inotropes and the vasoconstrictor. We started the drip noradrenaline at low dose. So to avoid the decrease in the blood pressure, because of the vasodilation, 
effect of regional anesthesia and dopamine drip kept ready. So what is the segmental epidural anesthesia? It is an advanced type of epidural anesthesia that provides blockade of the operative area which gives excellent patient comfort. And what are the advantages of the segmental epidural over general anesthesia? So there is the avoidance of polypharmacy, airway manipulation, there is a decrease in the post-op nausea vomiting, decrease incidence of thromboembolism due to early mobilization of patient, improvement in the perioperative pulmonary function, decrease in post-operative catabolism, And what are the advantages of the segmental epidural over non-segmental epidural? There is a better hemodynamic stability achieved as we are going to block only operative area. The better post-op pain relief. Toxic dose never exceeds even in a prolonged surgeries. Only operative area blocked, better patient comfort and post now comparatively it is very safe in elderly and the high risk patients. So whenever we are planning for the segmental epidural anesthesia, these are the five basic and very important points. We should consider this point first. First, the upper and the lower level of the segments to be blocked. Then the placement of tip of catheter. Length of catheter inside the space. After deciding the first three points, we should decide the fourth point. That is the entry level of epidural level, needle and the volume of drug. As the name suggests, that is a segmental epidural. So that there must be upper and the lower level. So in our case, that was a T4 to L1. As you can see in this picture, this is an area that is in yellow color, T12 to L4. That is to be blocked. And the catheter tip, that was in the center, that is L2 level. And catheter length placed inside, that was 3 to 4 centimeter. And our needle entry site was at L3 to L4 level. And we use the drug volume 6 ml. So the placement of catheter tree, that should be in the center of the area that is blocked. So the local anesthetic will spread equally on the both the sides of catheter tip when a patient is in a supine position. But when the length of the catheter that should be placed inside, it is 3 to 5 centimeter. As we all know, if we keep it more than 5 centimeter, that will cause the coiling, kinking, doubling or passage into the intervertebral phenomena. So the needle entry site, that should be two segments above or below from the tip of catheter. One segment that correlate with the two centimeter of length of catheter. So our entry site was the L3, L4. As we pass the catheter cephalic direction, we can do it by passing catheter in reverse direction also. So that time our needle entry site T11 to T12 and we can push the catheter cordially so the tip will come at L2 level. And the volume of drug used, that is depend upon the segments to be blocked. For the lumbar that will require 2 ml per segment, thoracic 1.5, cervical 1.25, and caudal 0.1 ml per kg per segment. In elderly, obese, and the short stretcher patient, you can decrease the volume by 0.5 to 1 ml per segment. So in our case, we use drug volume 6 ml. As our patient was very thin built and elderly. Uh, lidocaine with adrenaline 2%, 3 ml. And the ropiocaine 0.5%, 3 ml. With this volume, we achieved very good anesthesia. Then the intraop monitoring. 
intro of surgery plan change from the pfn to the open reduction internal fixation with dcs 95 degree plating so the blood loss was more than the pfn so we started the dopamine drip to achieve the hemodynamic stability maintain the hemodynamics with the noradrenaline dopamine drip and the iv fluid a blood loss was near about 200 urine output 100 ml and after the procedure patient shifted to icu with the dopamine and the noradrenaline drip and uh, tapered their dopamine stop on the same day and the noradrenaline next day these are the some pictures of intro this central line epidural catheter this is the dopamine and the noradrenaline drip this is surgery going on and this is one of the ecg of the patient which is showing the arrhythmia so conclusion anesthesia administration for patients with the cardiomyopathy can lead to perioperative morbidity and mortality during elective and emergency surgery therefore anesthesia and post operative care have to be planned and monitored with the knowledge of type of cardiomyopathy and their pathophysiology thank you